Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to go over the last part in Chapter 5, which is financial statement analysis. So now that you have a good understanding of the different financial statements, this section is going to teach you how to use the financial statements so that you can understand the health and performance of your company. So there's a number of factors that we want to take into account. One is that we want to ensure that we'll be able to compare the performance of our company over time and against other companies such as its main competitors as well as the industry as a whole. To do that, we can create something called common size or standardized financial statements. So we can create both standardized income statement and standardized balance sheet. So for the common size balance sheet, we convert the numeric values into a common size, which is a percentage, by dividing each item by total asset. To compute the common size income statement, we again convert each dollar amount into percentages by dividing each item with sales. So these are the first pass in terms of financial statement analysis. Uh, by converting uh, the dollar value into percentages, you enable us to compare a company that whose size have changed, growing or de decreasing over time, and also against other companies of different sizes. Once we have a general idea of the overall health of the firm, we may want to dive in deeper, and to that we need to compute financial ratios. And we can classify these ratios into different groups. Uh, the first groups are liquidity ratios. These are ratios that measure the very short-term financial health of the firm. Liquidity in finance refer to the ability of the company to meet its very short-term obligation. So liquid means uh, cash. So liquidity ratio means that does the firm have enough cash on hand or have enough asset that it can quickly convert into cash so that it can pay its bills. The next group of ratios are financial leverage ratios. This ratio look at the long-term financial health of the firm. So this will look at the long-term liability, the ability of the firm to meet its debt obligation over time. So not the immediate payment, but a longer range, um, maybe a year, three years, or five years. Next, we look at a group of ratio called turnover ratios. Turnover ratios measures the efficiency. Sometimes this is also referred to as the efficiency ratio of the firm. So what here, what this ratio measures is how effectively is the firm using its asset. And then um, the next ratio is the self-experimentary profitability ratio, how profitable is the firm. Obviously, that's very important. And to demonstrate all these factors, including the common size, balance sheet, and income statement, and financial ratios, we're going to switch over to the spreadsheet. So again, it's the same template that you have. So pause the video now and um, open up your spreadsheet so you can follow along. Now that you have your spreadsheet open, let's scroll to the tab that says table 5.8. Um, CS stands for common size, so common size income statement. Uh, the notation is the same as before. Anything that is highlighted in light blue is a formula that you need to enter. So remember that for income statement, we are dividing all the items by sales. Another name for sales is gross revenue. So the first formula, we're going to start the formula with the equal sign. And then this is the income statement. So we're going to scroll to the income statement. And we are dividing each item by gross revenue, including gross revenue itself. Since the denominator is always going to be the same, we can make this an absolute reference. And you can make something an absolute reference by pressing the F4 function. So you'll notice that in the formula, now you have a dollar sign in front of the column alphabet and a dollar sign in front of the row number. And that makes that a an absolute reference. Be sure to complete your formula by pressing enter. And now we have created um, the formula for gross revenue. 
And because the order of the income statement is the same, you can simply copy this formula to all the other cells. So to copy, I use Control C to copy, and then you can just hold down and use the arrow key to select all the cells that you want to copy it to and press Control V to copy. And you can do the same for all the other items. So simply go to the cells that you want to copy it to, hold down the shift key if you want to highlight more than one cell, and then use the up and down arrow key to select a cell. To paste, hold down the control key and press V. Um, scroll down, you have more items to do. So every single one that you need to do, you can just press control V. And then you are done. So this is completing the uh, common size income statement. So if you use the absolute reference uh, uh, F4 correctly, you can save your time for creating formula and be very effective. Now that we have computed the numbers, we can take a moment to t look at what the numbers tell us. So first, let's take a look at gross profit is 33.57%. Uh, and cost of goods sold is 59%. So that means um, every dollar we generate in revenue, we pay out 59 cents. It, it costs us 59 cents in terms of cost, cost of goods sold. Those are direct variable costs. Uh, we pull in a gross margin of gross profit, a gross margin of 33.57%. Uh, we can also look at other items, uh, things that you might be interested in is interest expense. Interest expense here looks to be quite high, is 21% of our revenue. Uh, so we are paying a lot of our money out in terms of interest expense. Um, and we end up with a net income of 3%. Next, let's go uh, move on to compute the common size balance sheet. So again, scroll over. So it's very similar. Again, every cell that is highlighted in blue, we need to compute. Remember that for, count for balance sheet, we divide every item by total assets. So again, it's not total current asset. That's one mistake a lot of students make. We're looking for total assets. So let's start with the first formula. So then we'll do that for each item in each year. So we can start with equal. And we want to go to the income statement, uh, the balance sheet. So we'll take the first item, which is the cash. And then we want to divide that by total asset. So again, we will um, use the same one for 2019. So again, I press F4 to make that an absolute reference. And we can copy this formula to all the item in 2019 because that is the total asset for 2019. So I'm going to ask you to, and you can do the same thing, not just in asset, but also in liabilities. So I'm going to ask you to pause and then you can uh, complete all the cells for 2019. And I'm going to take a moment to think about how you would do 2018 as well. And when you come back, we're going to check your answers. OK, a quick check on your answer include making sure that total assets equals to 100%. And total liability and stockholders equity should be 100% as well. Uh, you can pause the video to check on the other items. Um, and for 2018, um, did you get 0.27% for cash? If you do, then congratulations. So you have to create a new formula for 2018 because the denominator is different. The denominator for 2018 is the total asset in 2018. So you can check this formula. And once you created the correct formula, we can, we can copy this to the rest of 2018. 
as you can see, if you create your formulas effectively, it literally takes you seconds uh, to compute the common size income statements and the common size balance sheet. Uh, so again, just like income statement, I just want to take a second to go over what the percentages look like. So perhaps um, the something that you may want to pay attention to is the uh, how much debt the, the company carries. So in here, you see that uh, the company is financed 66.7% by debt in 2019 and 68.8% by debt in 2018. Equity represents 33% in 2019 and 31% in 2018. So the company is financed very heavily by debt. The debt to equity ratio is almost 2 to 1. So that is some of the useful information that you can glean from computing the uh, common size statements. Next, we're going to compute the financial ratios. So to do that, we're going to move on to the next tab, which is financial ratios. Um, I have included all the formulas for the financial ratio in this page as well, so that it's easier for you to create uh, the values. Um, in addition to that, you can also uh, find this um, formulas and more well written and, and long, with longer explanations in the textbook. For each of these um, ratios, the first thing you want to do is to look at uh, the components, where, whether or not the components comes from the balance sheet or whether or not they come from the income statement or whether or not to compute a ratio unique uh, components from both the income statement and the balance sheet. So if you're computing a ratio that involves items only from the balance sheet, then you can choose to compute a ratio for the beginning balance, for the ending balance, or using the average value. If you are, your ratio includes items only from the income statement, then there's no choice. You just have a single number for the year. If the ratio involves both income statement and balance sheet items, then you need to make a decision whether or not you're going to use the beginning balance or the ending balance or the average as uh, your balance sheet item. And in the textbook, we go over various cases and, and the reason why you may want to use one versus the other. So for example, if you want to compute the uh, cur current ratio, current ratio is defined as current asset divided by current liability. Since both current asset and current liability is uh, are from the balance sheet, we can use the beginning value, the ending value, or the average. Um, I'm going to show all three approach. So let's start with um, just the um, beginning. So beginning value will be the 2018 number. So again, we start with the equal sign. So current asset divided by current liability, and both comes from the balance sheet. So we're going to scroll to the balance sheet. Remember, we're doing um, ending value. So current asset for our beginning value, current asset for 2018 divided by, so slash. And then over here, we're going to look at current liability again for 2018. Once we created the formula, we can press enter, and that is our beginning value. Um, you can change the format for this by changing the percentage signs. Um, and you can also compute the ending value. Ending value will be 2019. So again, start the formula with the equal sign. Scroll to the balance sheet. And beginning value will be beginning. 2019. So again, you'll be good to see the uh, label. Make sure that we are using the correct number. So current asset divided by current liability. Again, once we have those, we press the enter sign. And again, we can change the percentage. Another option is to use the average value. So to use the average value, we need to divide the average by the average. So to compute the average, again, we start every formula with the equal sign. But to compute the average, we need um, to use some parentheses. So average is just beginning plus ending divided by 2. So we're going to start with current asset. So in the income balance sheet, so current asset, so we take the beginning 
plus, so use the addition sign, ending divided by two, that will give us the um, current asset. And we're going to divide that by the average current liability. So again, make sure that you put in the parentheses correctly. So we take the ending plus the beginning, and we need to divide that by two. So notice that this is the average current asset. And if you want to be absolutely sure, you can add more parentheses just to be to be um, sure that you get the average computer correctly. So that is the current average current asset divided by the average current liability. Okay. And you will notice that it is uh, it actually changed a little bit because what you see is that in the beginning current the current ratio is 79.65 percent um, the end is 83 percent not surprisingly the average is between the two so what that means is the company has been improving in terms is current ratio now we can do the same thing for um, the rest of these items now again um, it depends on how you want to um, organize your work so for example, if you're using the average, this can be a relatively long formula because you have to compute the average current asset, uh, average infantry, average prepaid expenses, and average current liability. Uh, you can break it into multiple steps. I'm going to show you many ways to uh, create your worksheet. So you can put all this into a single formula. I'm going to demonstrate that. And I'm going to show you how you can uh, break it into multiple steps so that your formula is easier to read. So if you don't have the whole formulas memorized, it may help you to have the textbook open so that when you move on to the uh, balance sheet uh, page, you will still have the formulas ahead of you. So we start with the equal, uh, the equal sign and I'm going to put a couple of parentheses there. So start with current asset. So again, this is the long formula. I'm going to compute the average all at once. So first, I'm going to compute the average um, current asset um, minus the average infantry so average infantry is beginning plus ending divided by 2 and then minus the average prepay expenses So now we have our numerator. So you have to be careful in counting your parentheses. And now we can divide that by our uh, numerator, which is the average current asset, so our current liability. So average current liability is, again, beginning plus ending divided by 2. Okay. And that is our quick ratio. As you can see, this turns into a very, very long formula. Now let's put this into the correct format. Uh, if you're not comfortable with building such a long formula, and in the beginning that may not be the best approach, we can break this down into um, intermediate steps. So one option is to compute the average um, items so that it's easier for you to use. And you can do this in a number of ways. For example, you can go to the balance sheet and you can add a column and compute the average value in this column. And the average value is simply the beginning plus the ending divided by 2. And you can copy this throughout um, your balance sheet. So now you have the average item 
uh, you can do the same thing for um, liability. You can also compute the average. So again, beginning minus ending divided by 2. And you copy this over. So now you have the average number. And to create the financial ratios, um, the, you can just use the average. So you follow the same thing. It's the same formula. So current asset, but instead of using computing the average on the fry, you use the average current asset that you have computed minus the current inventory, the average inventory, and minus the average prepay expenses. And divide that by the average current liability. So that makes the uh, formula a lot easier to construct. And of course, you get the same number. Uh, so comparing this formula versus this formula, this is a lot easier to see. And also, you know exactly um, what the average value is. So those are two approaches to uh, doing this. I think you get the idea. I'm going to pick a number, a couple of more ratio to demonstrate, and then I'll let you go ahead and finish the, the, uh, the calculation uh, on your own. So I'm going to pick, let's say, equity multiplier. Again, total asset divided by total equity. Both items comes from the balance sheet. So I'm going to just say equal, and then we go to the balance sheet. It's equal to total asset divided by total liability. So total asset. We'll take the average number divided by total equity. So that's our equity multiplier. And you can change the um, number of decimal places uh, so that it's easier to, to read. Um, the next item, times interest earnings ratio, um, um, is from earnings before interest and tax divided by interest expense. And that comes from, both items from, comes from the income statement. So equals, let's go to the income statement. Again, the income statement, we only have one year's number. So uh, earnings before interest and tax uh, divided by interest expense. And now I'm going to pick one that has two. So here we have um, a day's sales in inventory. So these are efficient uh, efficiency numbers or uh, average collection period. So this is a number that we have used a few times. So let's take a look at how we compute that. So to compute the average collection period, we need to divide 365 days by receivable turnovers. And receivable turnovers is equal to net revenue divided by average accounts receivable. So let's go ahead and compute that. So net revenue, that comes from income statement. And average accounts receivables comes from the balance sheet. So we start with the equal sign. Uh, we're going to scroll to the income statement pick up net revenue and divide that by um, from the balance sheet. So after you put in the divide by sign, you need to click on the balance sheet. And we're going to scroll over to find average accounts receivable. So make sure that you um, pick up the, the correct numbers. If you get, um, if you make a mistake during um, any of this uh, constructing a formula, the easiest thing to do is to press the escape key. And if you press the escape key, you can um, you can redo you can restart. Um, I'm gonna delete this and just demonstrate. So let's say I make a mistake in the formula. All I have to do is press delete and the formula will be gone. I'm going to start with the equal sign again. And say you move, you find the income statement, you pick up net revenue, and you forgot to put in the device sign, and therefore you go to balance sheet and you pick up something else. And you realize that you make a mistake. The easiest way is just press escape, and you can start all over.
that's probably the best way to fix any mistake. So I just put in the formula real quick again. Um, so net revenue divided by accounts receivable. So that gives us the receivable turnover. Now let's go to the next item. Uh, it says equals 365 days. So we just type in equals 365 divided by receivable turnover, which we already computed. So that gives us the average collection period. So go ahead and finish computing all the items. And then we're going to go over um, the meaning and how to interpret those numbers. The rest of the formulas are computed in similar ways. So I encourage you to um, try out on your own. Um, I do have all the answers here for you to, com to compare. And um, I'll also scroll down the, um, the formulas slowly um, so you can check them. Uh, notice that I, am, I have pre-computed the average on the, um, on the balance sheet page, so it makes the formula a lot easier um, to, to create. Um, I stop here for the um, payable turnover because the payable turnover uses purchases, which is not an item that uh, currently exists in the income statement or the balance sheet. So in fact, you have to compute purchases first. So you have to first use this formula, which is cost of goods sold plus ending inventory plus beginning inventory. So of course, cost of goods sold comes from the uh, income statement. So here we have cost of goods sold plus ending inventory. So let's go to inventory. So this is our ending inventory minus the beginning inventory. So that's our purchases. And once you have computed purchases, then you can compute payables turnover, which is purchases divided by average accounts payable. Once again, we have computed the average already, so we can just use um, the average accounts payable. And then the payable period is 365 days divided by the turnover that we just computed. Um, the rest of the calculation, as I said, is relatively straightforward, so I encourage you to um, take the time and make sure that you uh, understand how they are um, computed. Once you have computed the ratios, the most important thing is to use them to help you analyze the health of your business. Um, in here, comparing, um, I refer you to the textbook. Um, I'll highlight a few examples in this video, but they are by no means a re placement of reading the textbook. So the textbook goes a lot more in depth in terms of how you can use these ratios in combination to help you diagnose the health of a business. Um, having industry average will be very useful. So for example, if you look at your profit margin, you look at your gross profit margin, uh, is that a reasonable amount? Uh, well, it depends on the business, right? And the same thing for uh, net income profit margin on net profit margin, uh, as well as ROA and ROE. Um, the main difference between ROA, return on asset, and ROE, return on equity, is the use of leverage. So in this case, the use of leverage significantly improves the profitability of the firm. But at the same time, we have to then look at, well, how heavy is the liability burden on this company? So let's take a look at times interest earn ratio. In here, this company is actually okay, but not the safety margin is not huge. Uh, is times interest earn ratio is 1.23, so meaning that earnings before interest and tax is barely sufficient to cover interest. Um, we look at the cash coverage, coverage ratio is slightly better. It's 1.43, 1.4296. Um, so we see in here that the company actually used quite a bit of liability. Total debt ratio is 0.67, which means that 67.7.8% of the business is financed by debt. Uh, equity only accounts for 32%. Um, debt to equity ratio is 
two, meaning that for every dollar that the company put in as equity or the owner put in as equity, the owner borrows two dollars. So that's quite a bit of leverage, and that explains why ROE is so much higher than ROA. But that is um, that comes at a cost of a higher risk in form in the in the form of higher leverage. So that's just a, as I said, this is just a summary or, or a, a brief uh, look into this particular business, um, and. Um, be sure to review the textbook to see how the other ratios um, uh, are important and, and different ratios obviously will be more important in specific industries. Good luck.